Hello, I'm Beryl Dakers. Welcome to Palmetto Scene. As we head into what we now call the new normal, we'll continue to bring you the many unique stories that make South Carolina so special. One such story started just as the pandemic began to wreak havoc on our state and nation. Here's Palmetto Scene's Bradley Fuller with more. 15 months ago, the COVID-19 pandemic caused chaos in almost every aspect of our lives. Businesses and schools shut down, and our healthcare system was pushed to the limit as we all sought ways to battle the spread of this deadly virus. But out of the dim economic outlook for our nation came a ray of light as two young entrepreneurs joined forces to meet a pressing need for protective equipment. Today in South Carolina news, he had confirmed 397 new cases of COVID-19 and 11 deaths today. It makes me feel really good. Not only is it protecting me as a parent, but it's also protecting so many other students and parents. Uh, he is always thinking of a new way, always thinking of a new plan to get people what they need. If he is up and he is awake and he is on the phone and he is on an email, he's figuring out a way to keep you safe. Rhino Medical Supply, we're a fully integrated medical distributor and that's a, it's an important oh, distinction because we are actual distributors and not brokers. So we work direct with manufacturers. And in most cases, it's U.S. manufacturers. It's kind of how we were able to create a lane for ourselves and be different, where most of supply chain was coming from overseas, mostly China. We developed relationships with U.S. manufacturers. This time last year, during the start of the pandemic, February-ish, March of, of 2020, hospitals were scrambling and the bigger states, the bigger hospital system had a priority over what they were able to receive versus the smaller states and smaller systems. So if you were a smaller state like South Carolina or some of the smaller rural hospital systems, you didn't really have many opportunities or options to go to. If I'm being honest, was, was the barrier to entry was pretty low. You just had to have trust and you had to have the ability to deliver. Now it's more challenging because we're in it. So we're, you know, we're swimming with the, with the sharks now, which is what we want. And we transitioned ourselves from a brokering model to a, a true distributor model last year. And that was really Elliot Haney that was instrumental in that, in that transition. I came shortly after the company started. Um, so I didn't know any better. Um, I, I knew manufacturing. I had over 10 years experience in manufacturing. And I knew kind of how that, that, that worked and how we needed to set up uh, a distribution um, for the pr products that we were uh, that we were serving or the customers that we were serving. Um, and so really, we didn't know any better. We just leaned on uh, people that had been in the industry for, for a while and uh, just gained knowledge as we went. I always say it's like drinking through a fire hose. We really didn't know anything. And so we learned everything for the first time. And I mean, when you think back then, uh, the issues that were that were happening, you had hospitals and healthcare systems, small, uh, small hospitals in rural locations that didn't have the supplies that they needed. And then when you really started thinking about people in underserved communities, didn't even have access to a mask. And I remember, um, you know, watching CNN and, you know, they, they, they walking you through how to create a mask with um, a towel, right, washcloth with rubber bands. And um, so I just thought it was an important need for us to, to get involved with. A Columbia-based company, Rhino Medical Supply, and U of SC students who are members of the Zeta Epsilon chapter of the Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity dropped off more than 30,000 masks Thursday at Greenview Elementary. It will be divided up among five Richland One schools. The masks are extremely helpful. Um, the mask allow the kids to be safe because they are underneath the age of 12 and they're unvaccinated. So the mask give that protection, that layer of protection for um, students because they're not able to 
get the vaccine right now. Um, for me, it has been something that's been very helpful because I'm an adult and I'm able to get the vaccine to protect myself. But with these kids, we have to make sure that we're doing things that protect them. And masks are essential when it comes to protecting ourselves from coronavirus. This wave has been much more devastating than the last one we saw, sort of when we first started to learn about COVID and how it would affect people. Um, it's probably very scary the first time because we didn't know anything. But this time, we really know more, right? We know more information about how the virus spreads and what we can do to protect ourselves. And so for Rhino, masks and PPE and gloves and gowns have been their way of being able to help hospital systems, school systems, people that are going to school, people that are going to work, um, people that you know really need to continue their day to day have the ability to do so with the masks. For me, it's about one, you know, making sure that uh, teachers and educators and staff members have products that they need to help one protect them, and then two, just make it a safe environment for for the students. We we have to be there for them. I think that's what's really really important. We started out in a room, like literally, it's a room outside of my garage, and it's, it's, I play PlayStation in it, so it tells you how small it is. And we were we had some things in my garage that what I could store, uh, and then we moved into our warehouse because that's how the, that's how our business grew. So we were seeing experiencing um, exponential growth um, month over month. Um, I mean, it, it got to the point where we went from zero to 35 states within about 60 days, and now we're in all 50 states and three provinces in Canada. So Lance is not an eight to five worker. He brings the kids to work. He's had them out there packing boxes. They, you know, get him what he needs. Um, I think it's important for them to see um, work ethic. And I think it's important for them to see how uh, working in a team environment with people that you care about, with people that share a common goal is valuable. Lance and Elliot are doing amazing things. They're offering life-saving resources that are helping these students and teachers and parents be able to survive the pandemic and their purpose and mission is really transcending when it comes to how they say they put people at the forefront of everything that they do and they truly do. Join us now as we travel to a unique place in the upstate that focuses on the needs of the planet. Mushroom Mountain near Easley focuses on developing innovative fungal solutions for world hunger, pest control, and fighting disease through the power of the mushroom. We do just about everything you can think of with mushrooms around here. Think of it like Disneyland for fungi. I started Mushroom Mountain in 1996, and then Olga and I met about 15 years ago, and we had an idea to start a mushroom farm in South Carolina. So we moved here from Florida and started a mushroom farm at our house, and then we ran out of space, and now we picked up this piece of property, 17 acres with buildings, and we have 300 different species of mushrooms in our laboratory now, and um, what we do is learn how to grow mushrooms, teach mushroom cultivation, a mushroom identification, and also all the cool things that people can do with mushrooms for food, for the environment, even building materials. Typically the average day around here uh, is uh, laboratory work in the morning when everyone's clean and then pasteurizing sawdust and grain to actually produce mushrooms to shipping. So we have a full-time shipping department and we ship uh, five days a week year round the spawn so people can grow their own. People can plant uh, at their house or a small commercial farm. We also make extracts which is a medicinal food supplement, and we do mushroom extractions in the lab. It's like a concentrate that someone can add to their coffee or their tea and get all the wonderful medicinal benefits. I worked in a hospital for a really long time in a laboratory, and I was in uh, a room all day with no light, uh, no windows. Um, no one even knew we were there, and it just felt like um, very sad and depressing and like I wasn't really doing anything for the world, so I quit that job. It just feels more rewarding to do something that has no negative attributes for the world. You know, everything I'm doing here is good for the earth. We are finding things out about fungi 
that no one else has really discovered yet. Uh, for instance, you know, these fungi are out here in the woods and we find ants with mushrooms growing out of their brains. I mean, it's insane. We found some growing on German cockroaches. There's a fungus that grows on mosquitoes. And these are fungi that grow locally here. So we can clone them, amplify them, and develop products that can help us reduce or eliminate pesticides. And that's huge. We need to eat food that's not sprayed with pesticides. And we need to figure out that, hey, these fungi can help. This place is so odd. It's not just a mushroom farm. It's, it, it is a, an idea factory. So mushrooms create heat? We do a lot of tours here, and the uh, when, it, when someone comes here for the first time, they have no idea what they're in for. They just think they're coming to see mushrooms growing at a farm. And by the time they get to the end of the tour and they see all these different applications that people can, that we as a, a society can use mushrooms for, I mean, they're just walking away with their minds open. They're gonna learn about the life cycles of fungi, how we grow mushrooms, the laboratory, to how we compost, how we make building materials. How can we use mushrooms to make the world a better place? And people are very open and receptive to this because they've never been exposed to this. Mushrooms and fungi is the second largest kingdom on the planet. There's insects and there's fungi. There's millions of species of fungi out there and we have no idea what they do. It doesn't surprise me if tomorrow there's another big discovery because there's just so much. I'm expecting to see a lot of jaws on the ground and that's why I'm so passionate about it is because I see an awakening I see the spark of hope in people's eyes when they are going through this tour, and it's complete, like a transformation. The last time we were here, he was advanced in what he was doing, and he's even getting more educational and doing more important things for the environment, which is super important because we definitely need all the help we can get. This last room where he showed the progression of the mushrooms from yesterday where there was none, and today they're getting bigger, and I thought that was pretty informative. The lab space is the heart of the farm. You know, it's not just designed to make spawn for us to grow mushrooms. It is a fully functional microbiology lab. And you could take one little mushroom from the woods and just create millions of them in there. We can go in there and we can do trials with bacteria and we could figure out applications for what can these mushrooms be used for in industry or agriculture. You know, for instance, I had a fungus on a Petri plate and I cut it and it turned out to be a good substitute for rubber. You know, things like that. Things that are biodegradable that we need. There's almost nothing we can't do with fungi. Albert Einstein said, if we look deep, deep into nature, we'll find the solutions for everything. I started using lion's mane just sort of as a supplement on the side or as a tincture. I saw a lot of noticeable differences with my memory overall or just my focus and clarity, like just from a brain health standpoint. And then over the last month, I ran out and I could notice like sort of so, some of like my memory components starting to slip a little bit as well. So I got back on it recently. So I just wanted to come out and learn a little bit more about like cordyceps and some of the other components because I've noticed firsthand like what some of these things can do for you. A mushroom can be opportunistic, it can be territorial. Another day it can be symbiotic and mutualistic. Mushrooms create heat, carbon dioxide, and they sweat. And I tell people, what else does that? I was like, me. <laughs> and mushrooms, they like to mine resources until they're gone. And then they take over a whole new territory and start all over again. It sounds like human civilization, it sounds like people. So I try not to dwell on the negative aspects of what fungi might do and more of the positive things. And if we don't work together, mushrooms and, and humans, then we might, we might have some issues. So we have to put them to work and by helping them, they're gonna help us. Who knew? And now we have more from the great outdoors. With its fun and dynamic trails, Harbison State Forest has been a go-to area for avid mountain bikers for years, catering to all levels of riders. But don't be fooled, this is a challenging sport, and upkeep of the trail plays a huge role in keeping the forest both fun and safe. Neil Brown, I'm a CPA, I'm a CFP, a uh, tax and finance guy. Been seriously mountain biking for about five years, picked up the hobby probably about eight years ago and just, just love it and enjoy doing it. 
got a lot of different trails. Obviously, we're standing in front of Harbison State Forest right now. Uh, more of a cross-country, uh, easy trail system. You've got Sesquicentennial State Park on the other side of town. The cool thing about that is you got a lot of different variety of, of soil. So when it's muddy in Harbison, you got the sand over there that drains real well. But quite honestly, my favorite's probably here at Harbison. Consider it my home trail system. I get to come out here about three or four times a week, thankfully. You have to be very careful when you come out here as a biker or as a hiker. The trail systems, they're multi-use. So you gotta exercise some trail etiquette. Typically, uphill is going to get the right of way versus downhill. Hikers get the right of way over bikers. So we're last, but you just gotta exercise some, some etiquette and make sure everybody's safe. My name's Harry Mathis. You can see behind me, we actually have a work crew. We're building a new section of trail in Spider Woman. The trail system exists in um, cooperation with the forest activities. Harbison is a state forest, not a park, it's a working forest. The trail system's in, usually in really good shape. If it needs to be closed, it'll be closed to protect it. Uh, sometimes it's closed because they're doing logging uh, or a prescribed burn. But I've been a ranger out here for probably about 10 years, maybe, working uh, weekends. It fits well with doing the trail work, the volunteer work I do with Friends of Harvison. Uh, being a ranger gives me a little more access to the forest and I have a little bit better understanding of some of the issues that, that we need to deal with you know, as Friends of Harvison. I started uh, riding mountain bikes seriously probably around um, 1990. So I've been riding about 30 years and racing mountain bikes uh, all over the, the southeast. The trails uh, give us a lot of variety because we have trails that are um, built by the newest standards. We have single track trail, we have double track, technical trails, flowy trails. The trail work we do now uh, is based on the standards developed by the International Mountain Bike Association, IMBA. Uh, they do trail training for um, trail crew workers, and we've done those, we've had two events here at Harbison. So they taught us how to build the trails the right way. That's the first thing, is we wanna make sure that we're using the right design criteria, then we lay the trail out in, to meet those criteria to avoid you know, creating more problems or building a trail that's worse than what we're trying to fix. And so we'll start with uh, you know, a basic idea then we'll flag the route that we want to follow. And then we get a crew and uh, basically start, start building it. Within 30 minutes of most people's homes, they have access to some of the best mountain bike trails in South Carolina. It's a great variety. And we have about 25 miles of trail. We really encourage everybody to come out and take advantage of the Harbison Trail System. It's an incredible resource, one to be protected, but also to enjoy. I am with Service Saturday. It is an um, organization at University of South Carolina under the Leadership and Service Center. Once a month, out of a Saturday, we go into different organizations to help volunteer. This actually is my first time working with Friends of Harvest and State Forest, but while I've been here, I have really enjoyed my time so far. For any volunteers, come on out. It's a great opportunity. It's actually pretty fun. I've been having fun since I've been here. I don't mountain bike, but um, I do want to come back and see like all my heart that I put in and how the uh, trail turns out and actually, you know, walk the trail. I'm Corey Griggs. Uh, I have not been mountain biking that long, a couple years now. I'm really new at this. I find it to be really fun and you can also get a lot of exercise doing this. Like ever since my friend got me out here, it's been great. These experienced riders out here really help you out. You get to meet people, learn everything they have to offer and share and it just makes you want to come back. So I don't consider myself an avid biker, but I love just getting out here and experiencing nature. It runs the gamut from, from young to old, men and women, it's just an easy sport to get into at whatever level you're trying. Picked up some good friendship out here and a couple of guys we ride together all the time. And you know, we're pretty serious in what we do, but there's a whole different level of people come out here, families or you know, mid-level riders or extreme riders, it just depends. One of the real good things about biking is even if you can't get out here with your friends, we do a lot of activities through an app called Strava. 
And what that does, is kind of a, a social messaging app for hikers and bikers, but we can come out here and track our GPS and track our times and actually compete against all of our friends on Strava and other people who may not be your friends. You can see the top leaderboards to see where you pair against other people. We also use an app called Trail Forks to map things out and put it into our GPS systems for a turn-by-turn -turn location. You can't get lost in the woods, so it really helps. One of the reasons I got into mountain biking is because I like to exercise. It's a lot less wear and tear on my body than running. So being able to remove myself from the world for an hour or two hours a day to get out here, to relax, to enjoy the in nature, and to really just get away and enjoy life. So a lot of people come out here with headsets, and that's fine, but I come out here to get away from the world. It's a lot of cardio work, it's great exercise, and it's just something that's fun to do. So if I can kill two birds with one stone, why not? Here's another sports update. Did you know there's a resurgence among the roller skating community in South Carolina? Well, with their quad roller skates and a nostalgic return to outdoor fun, local skaters are literally taking it to the streets and the parks. Recently, a couple of friends started a local Facebook skate group, and they became part of the international skate organization, CIB. Let's roll on over to Owensville Skate Park to learn more about CIB Soda City. Roller skating just in general is one of the most freeing feelings, I guess. You know, because you're on wheels and you're just flying through the air. It's like a roller coaster, minus the safety, <laughs> but uh, I don't know, it's just, it's like very free. A feeling of euphoria and freedom when you're in the bowl, you don't think of anything else, it's you in the moment. It's one of those things where like once you start, you're just kind of like hooked, like you just want to like keep improving, keep getting better. CIB is an international group of roller skaters that primarily focuses on bringing roller skaters to the skate park. So they have chapters all over the world. The chapter in Colombia got started basically through me and one of my best friends. We had like just a very um, kind of, I guess like chill group of just people who already skated that we would just post like when we were coming to the skate park. When more interest started showing with our friends and things like that, then it started to be like, oh, okay, well, why don't we make something of it? And then that's when Carly and Shayna decided, you know, well, let's make a group. And then that group turned into them applying for an actual CIB chapter. If you're in an area that doesn't have a CIB chapter, you just apply and you get approved pretty quick. Once we got approved, we made a Facebook group and started hosting meetups. Well, Owens Field is Columbia's skate park, so that's where we come. Columbia has a very well-established skate scene already that really helped us build our community at the skate park. At the beginning, my mom and I, we just kind of went and in the morning and we skated here just to get comfortable with skating in a park. And then all of a sudden we came here one day and it was just like all these roller skaters here, which was CIB. And so I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. And then it was just like a really good community because like they just taught me a bunch of new tricks and they kind of just helped me slowly go into like park skating on roller skates. We do have a lot of new skaters who come and join. Uh, we try and help them out with the basic, make them feel comfortable being at the skate park. We've also established a flat skate for people who have just started skating and quite aren't ready for the skate park, so they can get comfortable with skating forwards, backwards, transitions, that sort of thing. It's um, good to see the new numbers now um, growing because there's only just a few of us out here. This community is really inclusive. Everyone's welcome. Um, we have people from all levels. I do kind of weird stuff out here, but we have people out here just learning to drop in. So it's nice to have a different set of people to skate with every day and just to have someone there to cheer you on. In case you fall, you have someone to help pick you up. We 
like to start everyone off with pumping. So just getting used to, you know, skating on an incline. Cause a lot of people, even experienced skaters, if you're coming from, you know, skating flat, it's a little bit of an adjustment. So we start everyone off with pumping, learning to carve. And then from there, it's just, you know, learning how to drop in, learning toe stop stalls, regular stalls. There's so many tricks that you can do. So I learned like a whole bunch uh, from YouTube videos from CIB uh, members and I don't know, it's just like a whole bunch of stuff like coping tricks. Like I did a spine transfer and then just like other tricks like on the transition part. Dropping in is basically you have your ramp, your quarter pipe or your bowl and you, you literally inch up to the edge of the bowl and then you put one foot in and you just go. My motto is trust your pads, you're not gonna die. So I'm very willing to fall, it's part of the process. It's one of the first things you should probably learn out here um, because we have knee pads on and everything. At the end of the day, if you fall properly, it doesn't hurt and it's a pretty smooth ride. When you finally hit that trick you've been working on, the euphoria of finally seeing all your hard work pay off in your own time, and unlike sports and other things, you're never gonna feel pressured. So if it takes you a month to hit a trick, it's fine. And it feels even better when you land it. Everyone cheers everyone on, you know? So if you're a beginner and you're just learning how to pump or you're experienced, you know, you have a group that is cheering you on, celebrating your accomplishments and just, you know, happy to see you thrive. Basically the whole uh, CIB team, those are my friends now. Actually, these are my closest friends um, that are out here right now that I've met through skating. It kind of is like a social sport because you gotta be around like other people. For me, it's like more fun like that because you can learn from other people, you can teach other people and it's just, it's a good vibe whenever there's other roller skaters here. We have so much fun out here. You can learn at your own progress. All you need is a decent pair of skates, a helmet, and some knee pads if you like your knees, and we can help you do the rest. If you are 14, if you are 60, you can come skate with us. Uh, you know, as long as you're, you know, willing to try it out, you know, we're here to support you and give you help and, you know, just give you a sense of community. For more stories about our state and more details on the stories you've just seen, do visit our website at palmettoscene.org. And of course, don't forget to follow us on social media, whether Facebook, Twitter, and or Instagram, at SCETV, hashtag Palmetto Scene. For all of us here at Palmetto Scene, I'm Beryl Dakers. Good night, stay safe, and thanks for watching.